Today on 52 Weeks of Why, I have a special guest that was interviewed, or excuse me, introduced to me by a good friend. Um, and we literally spent probably 30 minutes leading up to going live, just talking, and we kind of had to pull the plug on us having a conversation to record uh, and share with you a little bit of our conversation today. Uh, thanks to everyone as we've come around the halfway point of the 52 Weeks of Why and uh, the journey that we've gone down and the people that we've heard discuss their why has been so inspirational to me and uh, I can tell by some of the responses that I've gotten and messages I've gotten that it, it definitely helps so many people. Um, so before I get into uh, my guest today, I wanna share a quick quote as always, and this one's from Les Brown. Les is one of my favorite motivational speakers right up there with uh, Tony Robbins and Jim Rohn and Inky Johnson. Uh, Les Brown says, ask for help, not because you are weak, but because you want to remain strong. This is something in my life that I admittedly um, struggled with. I was terrible at asking for help uh, until only recently where I learned that the ability to reach out and ask for help doesn't mean that I'm weak, doesn't mean that um, it's a flaw. It means that I'm vulnerable and that vulnerability leads to better friendships and better bonds with people. Uh, and, and it's amazing how those people that I have asked for help, our friendship has grown dramatically because I've helped them and then they feel more open to ask for help from you. Uh, and it's just really cool how that ability to ask for help, as Mr. Brown puts it, uh, does lead to strength. My guest today is Dr. Candace McDonald. Uh, we had to struggle a little bit to get our schedules together. So thank you, Candace, for being here today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. I enjoyed our little uh, pre warm up. It was great getting to know you a little bit and to find out we're neighbors, which is super cool. Yeah, it's so interesting to me that you can have someone literally within a mile of you and never know it. And also someone who's of such similar like-minded uh, reading and things that you study. Um, and so before I want to get into a little bit of an intro, but I don't want to take too much of it because the way that you set it up with me was really powerful. Um, and so I would just want to ask some questions and let you kind of roll with um, your family dynamic and your education and where you find yourself now working for NASA. Um, so you've been married now for 11 years and have three children um, two of which are over 20 now, a 22-year-old son, 21-year-old daughter, uh, and a junior in high school who's 16, still at home. Um, so share with us a little bit about your neighborhood and your dynamic of where you live, because I think it's really cool. So being part of that Appalachian culture, I did what we always do and, and didn't move away. I actually moved next door to my parents. So my parents live on one side, my grandma lives on the other, married the boy next door, um, even though he's eight years younger than I am, and I didn't meet him till later in life. And uh, so, uh, and his family all lives on our road. So there's like his dad, his brother, his uncles, his other uncle, his cousins. We all kind of live on, on the same road. So it's kind of, we always kind of joke that it's the uh, Graham McDonald compound going on here. So, but it's great to have that family being that they were close by. We always know we have somebody there to support us if we need it. Yeah, so I'm in a very similar situation. Uh, mom and dad live next door. I don't think I've ever shared that on the podcast, so this is the first. Um, mom, I bought the house next door to my parents in 2001, um, two years after I came back to Ohio. So I spent a lot of time in Fort Lauderdale. They came up here about six years before I did. Um, and I, being from Fort Lauderdale, did everything I could to not come back to Ohio. Um, and had a humbling experience that one day I will share that I made the decision of my own accord to come back to Ohio and get my stuff together, as they say, in my very early 20s um, and bought the house next door. So I know exactly that dynamic now with an eight, a six, and a three-year-old. It's kind of a rite of passage for the three-year-old now to be able to put on his coat and his shoes and walk next door to grandma's house. And yeah. we all look out the windows and wave to them and grandma opens the door and kind of hoots at them. And it's this cool thing because my oldest daughter who's eight did it. 
middle daughter who's six did it. And now we get to watch Jet literally in the last six months do this all by himself. And he feels so proud of himself. And he's like, yeah, I got to walk over there and it's independence. Right. And uh, yeah, it's very, there, there's not much that can replace having them so close. I think that is so cool. I am a little jealous though that, see, I, I didn't get to, to move away. I never left. So I had to to live my young and dumb college years here so everybody knows all of my dirt. So that's the, that's the bad thing. So like, oh, why didn't I move away and do all these stupid things? So You went to school locally and um, had a little bit of a challenging experience in your grade years that I want you to set up because now uh, as we go into your success now, um, it's pretty cool to hear that side of the story to begin. Yeah, so um, I originally, I did not grow up all the way in this area. I actually grew up in Alliance, which, as you know, is um, ab about 15 minutes to the west of us. Moved out here when I was in the eighth grade, um, and that was a bit of adjustment going from city life, even though Alliance isn't like big city, but um, to the country life. And so at the end of my eighth grade year, as I was moving into high school, we had a meeting with the guidance counselor. And she said to my parents that I was not going to be, that she didn't feel that I'd be able to graduate high school and that college wasn't going to be an option for me and that I didn't really need to look at taking college prep classes. And so that was, you know, that was something she said in front of me, in front of my parents. So here was this person that basically told me I wasn't smart enough to go to college, you know, graduating from high school might happen, might not. So um, as time went on, um, graduated high school, I started to go to, to the uh, local branch of Kent State here, wasn't sure what I wanted to do, um, ended up getting pregnant, three kids, single mom thing ended up happening. Um, and I, I finally, you know, I was working on my, my associate's degree in human services and I finished that. And um, that to me, it was one of the hardest things ever to finish. Everybody else say, but you have your doctorate. How could the associate's degree be harder? But for me, it, it was a lot of overcoming my own personal barriers at life challenges, learning how to balance, not allowing that inner critic to get stuck in my head and telling me, oh, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. You've done all these things. You know, you don't deserve this. But so once I got that, that was a springboard. From there, I ended up enrolling at Malone University because I was looking for a, um, a bachelor's program that would work with my schedule. And Malone at that time had what they called the uh, degree completion program. It was for working professionals that were looking to finish their bachelor's degree in organizational management. And they only met one time a week. I'm like, I can do this. I can get a babysitter. I, you know, I can make this work. So I was able to, you would go through a cohort Finished that degree, went on to get my master's degree at Malone in organizational leadership, which I absolutely love that program, love learning. You know, I know we were talking about John Huntsman earlier and, you know, all the different leadership and the, the different theories out there. So that was, that was a great experience. And I remember, you know, as I was in the master's program, there was a professor who was finishing her dissertation and she shared about her journey. I was like, oh, I would, I think I'd like to do that. And so um, I was working at the state of Ohio at that time, and I'd been at the state for six years doing marketing and actually made a, a career move over to a, a university and, and took a position there because I'm thinking I can go to college for free. My kids can go to college for free. So I had this game plan. So while I was at the university, um, we had a, a summer camp that we were doing, and I had some, um, some protected information coming in, social security numbers and things like that, and I would keep it locked up. And the one day I wasn't at work and um, I was coming in late, my kid had a doctor's appointment and my office door was open. So I sent this email out and I said, hey, I don't know who opened my office door. I said, but please make sure you keep that locked up. I have protected information in here. You know, we got to protect that. And the, this gentleman who was, had his PhD writes back and says, you don't have an office. You just sit there. Only people with PhDs have an office. So I was like, well, I'm going to get one of those. And, and so I started to look at PhD programs at the university I was working for. I applied. And, and it's no secret, I was a horrible student in high school. I didn't take it serious. I just wanted to get done. You know, I, I was tardy more times than, than not, probably. Um, so I uh, applied. But in my, my master's program, I had one B, and that was a, a math-related class, accounting or a finance class, which I cried through, but I got my B. But uh, so 
I was applying, I applied for this PhD program. And I remember this because I was at a conference in Indianapolis and I get this rejection letter and it came and I was just like devastated. It said basically that because of my ACT scores back from high school that I couldn't get into this program and I should consider taking more classes at that university. I'm like, well, what about my, you know, master's degree? What about me? You know, they, they weren't even looking at that. So I like, I was so down on myself and I'm sharing this with um, these individuals that are there. I had not met, met them. They were friends of friends and we were all kind of in a group. And one, he, Dr. Harry Carter, and, and he's got his PhD and Dr. Dennis O'Neill, who was the United States fire administrator. And he looked, they both looked at me and said, no, you're not giving up. You're going to keep pushing forward. So they coached me and encouraged me. And they, they said, they looked at my husband because he was there with me and they said, she's about to spend a boatload of your money. She, and so I ended up at Walden University, which is a private school, and I had to pay for it. But it, the degree, it was meant to be. So now I have a doctorate in business administration with a specialty in homeland security. So once I enrolled in that, I started looking for different jobs because I thought, I don't want to work at this university anymore. If they don't believe in me, I'm getting the heck out of here. And, and, uh, and I had actually taken a pay cut to go there because in my mind, take the pay cut, go there, free college for everybody, win-win. So... Um, and I'm looking online and this, this internship at NASA appeared. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna apply for a job at NASA. It kind of became a joke. And, and I, I'll be honest, I didn't even know there was a NASA in Ohio at the time. And, and so I'm like, all right, yeah. And so I applied, several months later, I get this phone call and I have an interview. I'm like, I have an interview with NASA. This is so cool. So then I find out that the, the John Glenn Research Center is here in Ohio, located in Cleveland and in Sandusky. And there's 3,500 people that works there. And we do all these really cool things that, you know, you know, from communicating with the International Space Station and inventing all these really cool things that impact our everyday use. And, you know, so I apply, go to the interview. They, they tell me that they have like, like hundreds and hundreds of applications. And I think they're interviewing like 12 people. So then I get called back for the second interview. And then, I, you know, then I got that job offer and it was just, you know, it was overwhelming because I go back and I think about that eighth grade guidance counselor who said, you're never going to make it. I'm like, yeah, now I'm at NASA. And so I've been at NASA almost seven years. It's been great. Um, you know, I, I love what I do and I work hard at it. I, I actually just got the, uh, the Early Career Achievement Medal, which is one of the highest medals that you can get in NASA for achievement. So that, that meant a lot to me being able to get that because for me, I, I wanted to work against everything that that guidance cons counselor thought about me. You know, those words to me said, you know, you're lazy, you don't have a good work ethic, you're not smart enough. So I've really, that's kind of, you know, when we kind of talked about that why, my why, my driving factor has been, I don't want to be that stereotype. I don't want to be the stereotypical Appalachian girl with the blue collar parents. You know, I, I want to be, you know, I want to be who I, I'm meant to be and be able to make a difference. When that eighth grade teacher said that, what was, what was going through your mind at that time? Um, you know, I, I was thinking, okay, I guess, you know, at that time, neither one of my parents had graduated, had been to college. So I didn't know a lot about college. So it was just like, okay, I guess I'm going to go and work at the plastic factory like my dad. That was kind of what was my thought. This is the, the path forward. And however, while I was in high school, my mom actually enrolled in college and became a social worker. And so she put herself through college as well. So being able to watch her kind of break that cycle and, and break that, and I always say the break the cycle of poverty, break the, because both my parents grew up very poor. Uh, my mom, who is, um, I, I probably shouldn't say her age. So I'll just say she's 20 years older than I am. Uh, that'll keep me from getting in trouble. Um, she grew up in this area in, in Beloit with no, no running water in her house. And so she's not that old. So when people hear that, I'm like, yeah, my mom grew up in a house with no, no indoor plumbing. My dad at the age of 13 had a full-time job to put food on the table and pay for bills in his house. And so my parents have amazing work ethic, but you know, college wasn't something that was presented to them, but being able to watch my mom, you know, go through that. And then she would drag her books home and she would drag me out to Kent State Salem. And you know, why she, you know, I'd sit, I remember sitting in the lobby doing my own work while she was in class. So, um, which people probably frown on now, but you know, it, but it made an impact on me. And so, um, I began to get curious and said, you know, you know, what can I do? Here's the dreams that I have and what do I need to do to achieve those? So the, it, it's interesting to me that 
number one, somebody can make that kind of judgment call on a 13 or 14 year old um, and kind of create a destiny for them that doesn't exist mm -hmm. and almost, I don't know if this is true, but almost continue to be the voice of the naysayer in your head. Um, maybe even to this day, that person may be the naysayer voice in your head that you, you, you didn't deserve that. And, and yet somehow it became the motivation for you um, after witnessing mom do what she did and realize the goal that she had set for yourself, understanding that you could also accomplish the same goal. So fast forward to the other rejection, which was making application to Kent State for the PhD, understanding that you had already achieved the, the goal of going to college and the goal of um, getting your master's degree while still hearing yet another naysayer say you don't have an office because you don't have a doctorate, while getting a rejection from them for the school to receive your doctorate, that's yet another voice of the naysayer coming at you and telling you that you can't achieve. What was what helped you? Because because mom in that situation, her goal orientation to finish college, you had already realized that. I don't know that what she had gone through could could really relate to what you were experiencing with the doctorate experience. What helped you move past the two naysaying voices and the rejection that happened at that point to to say, I'm going to do this? So I think that goes back to having a good mentor. Again, you know, I was in Indianapolis. My mentor is named Steve Austin, uh, a gentleman from Delaware. And I always tell people, when you think of men mentors, don't think they have to be the same gender. Don't think they even have to be come from the same generation because Steve is a 70-year-old man, you know, from Delaware, but he's been my mentor. And so he said, you know, that he says, I want you to share this story that you didn't get in with these people. He connected me with Dr. Carter and Dr. O'Neill, who then became mentors as well. So I think that's why it's, it's so important that we, you know, as, as people, as society, that when we hear other people, you know, letting their inner critic come out as they start to doubt themselves, we say, sister, brother, no, 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 you can do this. You know, how can we help you to meet that goal? What barriers do we need to help you overcome? So I think that's the important part is, is having those voices, those mentors behind you to say, not just to say that, oh, you can do that, you can be anything, but to say, let's map out a plan together. Let's figure out how you're going to get over these challenges. How did you connect with Dr. Steve Austin? So it's, um, Steve Austin is not a doctor, although he should be. Okay. So um, at that time I was a, I, you know, I was serving in my local community as a volunteer firefighter. And, and I saw that there was a, a real issue in the fire service, um, you know, with recruitment, with retention, with some ethics, some things like that. So I started to do some research. And so, and I started looking for ways to get involved to figure out how can we fix this problem? Because I'm a fixer. I love going in to organizations and helping them develop solutions and fix their problems. I'm real big into Lean Six Sigma and, and um, process improvement. And so um, I, I stumbled across the National Volunteer Fire Council. I reached out to them and I said, hey, how do I get involved with you guys? You guys are doing really cool things. So then I got invited to some of the stuff that the, the uh, NVFC was doing. And, and at a meeting, I met Steve Austin and he says to me, I'm going to make you a deal. And I'm like, oh yeah. And he says, yeah. And I, you know, he says, if you make a $5 investment, I'm going to change your life. I'm like, all right, here's $5. He says, you're going to, you know, join the Cumberland Valley Volunteer Firemen's Association. I'm like, okay. And so Cumberland Valley was this group of firefighters from all over that were doing amazing things to prevent, um, to prevent firefighters, first responders, towing, EMS, and police from getting struck on the roadway. They were addressing the reputation management issue that the fire service was facing because we had a lot of reputation management issues. We have some firefighters that, that do some things that, are not okay that impact the rest of us. And, and this was all before really social media was picking up. So he was ahead of that. They had developed this white paper. So I started to teach for them on reputation management issues in the fire service. So during my master's degree, I actually researched, you know, I spent a lot of time researching and that was kind of my, my basis for my master's program. Any paper that I wrote was kind of tied to that. It was like, how can I give back? So that's how I met him. Again, it was getting involved. And I always tell people, you know, you get out there, if you volunteer, you can make great connections that, that can really change your life. And, and, and the other thing that I always tell young people, they say, how do you get to be where you're? 
you speak at all these conferences all over and how did you get to this? I said, I ask questions. If I'm at a conference and a speaker speaks, I go up and say, hey, how did you get here? What advice do you have for me? Here's my career goals. What can I do? And I know I, I shared with the, you with this before, but I truly believe that we are to blame for our own happiness. You know, I could have accepted that destiny that I'm not going to graduate high school. I'm not going to graduate college, but I really believe that we are to blame for our own happiness. And I know I shared this, this with you, this logo that we had made for our women's empowerment group that I started. And it says, some people uh, claim I'm the woman to blame. And, and I had these made for all the women and, and had them put on cups. And I tell them, you know, this is not, not that you're, that this is to remind you that you're to blame for your own happiness. And you've got to, you know, you got to own that. It's so cool that inadvertently you got involved with the Cumberland Association and met Steve Austin, and he is the person who gave you the 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 voice that you needed to overcome the rejection. That two paths that are completely unrelated to one another, right? Two things that two different destinies, two different life paths that you were on. And yet somehow the one was able to positively impact the other. And, and for me, it's, it's a testimony to, to having your finger in more than one thing because we're, so, we're taught in today's world to be so hyper-focused on one thing and tunnel vision in and be an expert on one thing that we tend to lose sight of, of the bigger picture and the other opportunities that can come uh, from volunteering, from being involved in the community, from having uh, a little bit of an act of service in your day-to-day -day routine. So you skimmed over this, but I want to make sure that we, we say it clearly and concisely. Um, share with us your why. So my why, my why is that I don't want, I didn't, my why goes back to that little girl in eighth grade. If I could go back and tell her, sister, don't listen to this. You can be anything that you want. You just have to have a clear cut plan. And this is how we're going to overcome every single barrier. So that's been my why. I wasn't going to allow somebody else to define my destiny for me. I get to make, I get to decide how tomorrow is going to be based on the actions that I take today. So that, that's that been my why. I, I, you know, every time somebody has told me no, I'm like, okay, how can I do this? How can I get away? How can I get around this? And, and um, you know, sometimes that's been a challenge because there's been a lot of rejection, a lot of no. And um, and what I've learned as you move forward, there's a, a lot of judgment as well as you start to, to do things and, and people will say things that, that are unkind. And it's like, oh, I don't have time for that. I'm worrying about me. So for me, it was, I seize every opportunity that's in front of me. People say, you're doing what now? I'm like, oh yeah, this was presented. I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I'm a certified firefighter, a certified EMT. I had a social work certification, a drug and alcohol certification. Um, I, you know, I just recently work, I, I'm getting, I'll have a, a social media analyst certification. And I'm like, yes, I want to take this class. So anytime something's presented, I jump on it. That's the other thing is opportunities don't always come around a second time. So when they're there, you can't be afraid to jump on them. You got to raise your hand and say, I think I want to do this. And you can't worry about what anybody else thinks. And I think that's the biggest thing, the hardest thing for me that I had to overcome is that when those, those naysayers and, and when those people would be mean or whatever, or say think, unkind things to me that I, I'd have to not allow myself to shut down. I'd have to remember, nope, it doesn't matter what they think because at the end of the day, you know, they, I don't have to answer to them. Well, I want to summarize this. Okay. I, I want to see if I can say this in a sentence that, that maybe sums it up, that your why is to not allow yourself present and future to be defined by other people's thoughts, actions, or judgments. Absolutely. I, I want to define my own destiny. As you look back, do you think the, the desire to not allow other people to define your destiny, was that something that happened as you were in high school? Is it something that, that came to you as your why when you were in college? Was it the doctor that says you don't have an office? When was that? When did that come up and really you, you knew that this was going to be your why? Um, you know, I, I think that it was something I remember in high school, um, there, there was something I wasn't happy about and, and you know, and it was tied to, to a crime and the way the law was and the law was written to, um, not protect the victims. And I was complaining to my mom about it. And I, she says to me, then get the law changed. 
I'm like, what? She says, write the state representative a letter. Let's get the law changed. So I was 14 or 15. I wrote a letter. He didn't listen to me. So I went to another county. I found another state representative who would listen to me, who then invited me to come down to, this, to Columbus and testify to get this law changed. So then my state representative showed up at my door because, you know, I put him on blast. I didn't know what I was doing. I was 15, 14, 15. And, and so for me, it was that, you know, that voice of my mom saying, you know, don't, don't let those doors shut, find a way around it. And so I always say, you know, with, me, with being a firefighter, I'm saying, if a door shut, I'm going through it with an ax. You know what I mean? It's not going to stop me. I'm going to find a way around it. So, and, um, and I get that, you know, as you're going through that and you're working through that, you do have to be prepared, you know, for one, dealing with your inner critic. And, and you also have other critics out there that do speak up, that, that may stunt your growth. And I've let that happen before. You know, somebody will say something, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to share that. But that's where you have to be grounded and anchored to your, your own values so that you don't forget your why, why you're doing something. Now, the, the recognition that you just got from NASA for a career achievement, I think it was, um, how, how did that happen? Tell us a little bit about that. So um, my boss had nominated me and she, I, so one of the cool things that I get to do on the job is, is I actually get to um, design security measures, um, do assessments, do protective details of VIPs. I oversee all the day-to-day -day security operations. And when we were testing the, um, the Orion, the Artemis that's going to take go up to Mars. So I got to design the security plan to help move that and, and move that forward. And so I always jump in. I'm always willing to help. We do a lot of Lean Six Sigma. I got certified as a green belt um, in Lean Six Sigma so that we could do process improvement, improve our organization. So those are some of the things, you know, that I've done. I'm always willing to jump in, lend a hand to my coworkers. So I think it was, those were the reasons that she nominated me. Um, and so really, you know, I was really touched when I got that email. I am a little disappointed that I don't get to go to a ceremony this year because of COVID, but that's okay. Uh, but it was, you know, it, it was nice to be able to be recognized by my supervisor. Finally, I want to finish up with, um, to talk about your Success Up Life website. I want to talk a little bit about that and, and how you are continuing to empower women and other people. Um, share with us a little bit about that. So one of the things I, I have a website, successuplife.com. I, you know, I try to offer um, through my social media, through Instagram at KSU Candice um, and on Twitter. I, right now I'm doing a 30 days of gratitude challenge with people, trying to encourage them. I try to promote positivity, you know, really empower other people through Success Up Life. I, you know, I, I do a lot of speaking across the country and work with organizations um, on team building, on process improvement. But what I, that to me, I, I like doing that stuff, but it wasn't fulfilling that, that need. So I created Women in Wisdom, which is a uh, women's empowerment group for women to come together and empower one another. And we've done a lot of cool things. We, we've done vision board activities. We've done, um, we did a cruise last year. We're getting ready to do our, our second annual cruise, which we've got 30 women, sign, or 28 women signed up. Um, and, and we don't discriminate. Men come too. We, I always say there's a place for men here. As long as you're supportive, we want you there. So, um, so I, I, I need to make sure I, I, I put that out there. But I wanted to create a safe place where women could come together and, and not let that inner critic get in the way where they didn't feel like there was clicks or, you know, where they, they felt like there were these, um, like, you know, that they didn't fit in. And so it's been so cool because we have a super diverse group from, um, from socioeconomics, from cultural diversity. We've had women from Florida, Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, PA, and Ohio, all in Delaware, all join us for different activities. Like we, we did a float over the summer, a social distancing river float, and we had women um, from Maryland drive up to participate. So we was formed a really cool group. We've gone out and done community service projects. So, you know, and that, that's what it's about. It's just about coming together. And, and I'm very clear with, with the women as we get together. I'm like, you know, this is a, a very inclusive environment. And I challenge people, like, if you're with me, I'm always saying, I don't want to hear any complaints. If you have a complaint, you have to come with a solution. So I always challenge people that to, to flip, I always call it flip the script. So, you know, if you're going to complain about something, okay, you can complain, but what's the solution to fix it? We got to flip that script. So that's what we do. We have a great time. And to me, it's been super cool. One of the things that we did pre-COVID, well, at the beginning of COVID, um, 
I used our Refuse to Sink logo, which was the anchor with the Refuse to Sink uh, saying on it, which was from our conference last year. And I used this to develop a campaign to encourage healthcare workers and first responders. So I wrote a little card about staying anchored to your values and you know not sinking during this time. And it just caught on. I actually sent out over a thousand of these anchors um, across the country to different nurses and healthcare providers. And it was really neat to see the different responses where people said that it made a difference in their life and how much they appreciated it. Um, so that was, you know, those are the things that I enjoy doing that I'm very passionate about. Um, you know, it's, it's great to be a part of something that where other people come together and we can just kind of give and, and support one another. You've got certain career rewards that are a part of your career and your job and then there are other rewards that uh, i don't want to say they're selfish but they're more rewarding to the deeper part of self they're more rewarding to the spirit and to the soul for the way that you're helping and influencing the lives of others um and you hit on something a a, a problem that has not at least one solution is an unfortunate situation so if you come to me with a problem and it doesn't have a solution, it's an unfortunate situation and we can call it that and move on. Mm -hmm. If it's truly a problem, it will always be accompanied by at least one solution, right? I love that philosophy. That's a John Maxwell thing that, that he stands by religiously. Um, I want to finish with something that I think everybody here would like to hear a little bit about if you're okay with talking about your husband catching COVID um, being on a respirator in the hospital and share a little bit about that experience and, and what you went through and what he went through uh, and that he's okay now, right? So we want to finish with that, that it's not a sad story, uh, but it's worth it, especially now uh, for people to hear a firsthand account of, of what it's like to experience that. Yeah, so my husband is an ER nurse and um, he contracted COVID back in, in a, early April. Um, it, it was kind of crazy because he ended up sick and we're like, oh, it's just a cold and, and you know, and, and, um, and then he ended up, um, he declined very quickly. He ended up on a ventilator and that was probably the hardest thing I'll ever do in my life. One of the hardest things was dropping him off at the hospital, not being able to go in with him not being able to be there for him because, you know, at that, you know, nobody could go in and I took him to the hospital that he works for. And so I, I have to commend that the, uh, the staff at university hospital, because they were his family when I couldn't be. And, um, and so that was very difficult. You know, he went to the hospital on a Tuesday. Um, he was admitted the next day, his boss called me and, and, you know, I could just tell she was so upset. And she said, he's going to be placed on a ventilator. And she said, and she looked at him and she's FaceTiming and she says, Travis, tell your wife you love her. And, and you know, and as he's trying to breathe. And, and so he goes on the ventilator and, and they would take the iPad in. And, and obviously they couldn't visit him either because he was in the COVID unit, but they would um, walk by the window and, you know, kind of peek in. Obviously they weren't going in and they were so supportive. The staff there became like my family. And, and so people say, how did you get through that? How did you get through that? Um, so my husband and I have not always had a perfect marriage. We've had to work at it. And, and so we really have figured it out in the last couple of years. And, and some advice that somebody gave us was to date your spouse. So we started doing these weekly, we, every week we have a date. It's like, what night is date day? And we go and we have our dates. It might be just a walk, it's dinner. And then, um, then on our 10 year anniversary, we uh, went to Clearwater. I was speaking at a conference there and he came with me and we actually did a photo shoot for our 10 year anniversary on the beach. And um, it was great. And so, some, some of the photos look like they should be on a romance novel. It's kind of funny when we look at them. But when he was in the hospital, those photos meant the world to me. I held on to those. So my advice to people is take the photo you know, don't think it's, that it's cheesy. Take the time to take those photos because those memories are what you hold on to. The, and, you know, it kind of goes back to the, the anchor thing is that while he was in the hospital, I had to do things that I had control of. So I really pushed the anchor campaign when I was in the hospital. I'm like, okay, who can I send anchors to? So I had people that were coming, like I had a drop and somebody would take the mail and mail them out for me, would bring me stamps and, you know, because for me, I couldn't control what was going on with him, but this is something I could control and that I could do to help others. And so to me, that made me feel good, being able to encourage others. And so um, 
Travis, he uh, he was in the hospital for a week, and then he came home and he recovered. He's back to work. He's do doing phenomenal. So we are very, very grateful that, you know, he's recovered. I know not everybody's had that happy ending, and it breaks my heart to hear those stories. I will first say that it's amazing that he went through what he did and is recovered and is better, and thank goodness that that's the case. Uh, my wife and I have subscribed to the weekly date night for four or five years, every Wednesday, um, with an eight to six and a three-year-old. This can be a challenge. Um, it's never a good time to, to walk out the door, uh, but in the absence of those, the crux of your conversations with, with the, the season I find myself in, our chores, who's going to pick up who, who's going to do what, who's responsible for what chore. And we found ourselves in this rhythm of, of lack of real conversation with one another instead of just barking at each other, orders and taking orders and who's got to do, do, do. And we never had time to talk about what do you want to do next year or in three years or five years? Where do you want to go on vacation? What kind of things do you want our children to read and learn about this coming year? Those conversations can't happen in the absence of, of a date night and spending time alone, uh, especially when they're young. Uh, it's definitely a challenge and you have to force it, right? Because it's not a convenient. Every week is a struggle to get out the door and have that date night together. But every week we come back refreshed in our relationship, right? Because part of that is demonstrating for us, demonstrating to our children that we love each other. Um, and they see that when we come out of that, that, that we're that much stronger. Uh, thank you so much, Candice, for your time, for sharing your story, for sharing your why and for not listening to the voices of the naysayer and not giving up I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to hearing about your journeys.